All right, guys, so you're there in Leviticus chapter 19. If you can turn to verse 27, Leviticus 19, verse 27, and it says there, You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shall they mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. So the title of my sermon tonight is, Thou shalt not mar the corners of thy beard. So it's an interesting verse, that one. I remember the first time I read that many, many years ago, and I was a bit perplexed. Of why is God giving them commandments about how to wear their beards or how not to shape their beards? So it's, a, it's an interesting commandment, but, but this actually is a commandment of God. So if they were to go and mar the corners of their beards, whatever that is, and we'll have a look at that in a moment, they will be committing sin. So what I want to do tonight is look at this commandment and see why he gave it to Israel and then look at the application that we can take today and what it means for us today. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable uh, for doctrine. So it's a bit of an unusual one. We're, trying to, we're going to try and work out what that exact, exactly means. So it says that you're not to mar the corners of our beard. So if you, were turned to, if you can turn to Leviticus 21 verse 5, we're going to see another scripture verse about this commandment. And if we compare the two, we get to get a bit of an idea of what's going on here. Leviticus 21 and verse 5, it says, They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. So what we see here is the commandment repeated. So it's whatever God's trying to say to the children of Israel, it's no small thing, it's no throwaway commandment. Like he's repeated it twice, and just in a couple of chapters later, he's mentioned it again. So it's no small issue. It's, it's a serious commandment that's repeated twice. And in the second mention of it, it says there that they shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard. So if you compare the two, so shaving off and, and marring sort of fit together. So what I guess that means is, like, you've got the corners here. Like, at the corners here. And if you, if you mar your corners so, the, so you're bored, then this is what God's commanded them not to do. So basically today it's like, I guess it's like having a goatee. Okay, so God's saying, you know, don't shave off the corners. So not exactly sure what that means, and it's not really the issue. Exactly what was going on here is not really the issue, and we'll look at that later. But trust me, the children of Israel, they would know what God's talking about. They would know what the issue is and how not to wear their beards, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. So when it, whenever it comes to looking at a verse in the Bible that may be a little bit unclear... Well, the golden rule is, is look at context. Look at the context in the, in the chapter and the context in the book, and then you're going to be able to get a good picture, a good understanding of what's going on. And that's how we read difficult verses like in Hebrews or Galatians, Romans, anywhere in the Bible. You look at the context and it makes sense. And when you take them out of context and, and make up your own interpretations, that's when you can get into error pretty quickly. So just turn back to Leviticus chapter 19 and let's start looking at some context and let's see what, why is God giving them this command? Why is God concerned about their beards and, and, and how they had their hair? At the start of Le- Leviticus chapter 19, Brother Tim read there for us in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, and I the Lord your God am holy. So the context is he wants the children of Israel to be holy. That's what the context is. And then he goes on and gives certain commandments, don't lie, things like that. And then don't mar the corners of your beard because he wants them to be holy. He wants them to be a separated people under himself. Okay. And if you go back now, look at more context at Leviticus chapter 18, verse 1. If you can turn there, please. And if we read the next few verses, we'll soon work out what's going on. Verse 1 of Leviticus chapter 18. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. So God's saying... Don't, you're going to go into this new land and you're going to see a lot of people looking different, 
dressing different, having their beards different, having their hair different, different ordinances, don't be like them. Don't follow after them. Okay, that's what God's saying here. He's warning them, when you go into this land, don't be like them. And, um, and because God wants Israel, his people, to be separate from the people of the land. Okay, I read this this morning in my Bible reading, so this is a late addition to the sermon. I'll just read it to you. It's from Exodus chapter 11 and verse 7. I'll just turn to it for you. And let me read it. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So God's saying there's a difference between Israel and the Egyptians. There's a difference between Israel and the Canaanites and those nations. And, that's, and there's a difference between us and the world. Amen. Still is a separation. So God's big on separation. He wants his people to be holy. Okay, so, so God's saying to the children of Israel, you're going to go into this new land and you're going to see a lot of different types of people um, having certain hairstyles, certain trends, certain fashions. Don't even mar the corners of your beard like these guys. Don't even get marks on your flesh like these guys. Don't cut yourself like these guys do. So God's commanding the children of Israel, don't even look like these people in the appearance. Don't take one step towards being like the Canaanites. So God's putting commandments in place so they don't even take one step to, be, to learning their abominations. He said, don't even shave your beards like these guys. I want you to be set aside and holy unto me. And Leviticus 18, just jump down to verse 9, says there, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of the nations. So God's saying, don't learn to be like these people. Like when you learn something new, you think about learning a new skill, a, a new sport, it, it's a process, isn't it? It's a journey. You don't learn something like that and now I, I can play tennis. Like it's something that you learn. So God was saying to the Israelites, don't learn to do after their abominations. And part of learning to do their abominations, it, it starts with looking like them. So he's saying don't even learn. Don't even start to learn their abomination. And he puts commandments in place to stop them from learning their ways, because he loves them. He loves them, and he wants them to be a pure people, a special people unto himself. And he doesn't want them to even start to take one step towards doing their wicked abominations. And in his love and compassion, he gives them commandments. Mar not the corners of your bed. Don't get Christian tattoos. I remember one time, when I, over 20 years ago now, I was working in Western Australia, with um, some, some mates from the jail, we had a contract, the jail I worked at had a contract to staff the, the, the detention centres where the boat people are. So we're over in Western Australia and we had a day off, so we're going to Broome on, on, the, on a day off and all my unsaved mates are going to get tattoos. And they say to me, why don't you come and get a tattoo, Jason? Get a, get a real Christian, good Christian tattoo, there's good cross tattoos you can get. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. At the time, I didn't have the conviction from the Word of God that it wasn't right. It just, I just knew, because I had the Holy Spirit, that that wasn't right. But these Israelites, it would have been pretty easy for them to see all these markings upon the flesh of these um, Canaanites and what have you. You think, well, maybe I'll just get a Christian tattoo. You know, maybe just something of, you know, something to, to honour God. But no, don't even put any markings on your flesh, not even a Christian tattoo. And God doesn't want us to learn the behaviour of the world. And that's the, that's the point of the message tonight. So if you can turn to back to Leviticus 18 verse 4, I know you're still in Leviticus. In verse 4, rather than learning the abominations of the Canaanites, God says, ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So he's saying, don't live like these guys. You live according to how I tell you to live. And that's what God was commanding Israel. Because the devil knows if you just take one step towards being worldly, that, that's all he wants. He just wants the door to be open just a little bit and then he just kicks it open and given enough time, you'll be just like the world. And that's why God says, don't even learn. Don't even think to... Sh- to shave the corners of your beard like these guys do because 
they're looking at these Canaanites and they've got their trendy beards and their, their crazy shaved bald heads and they're, and they're cutting themselves and they've got these markings on their body and he's saying, look, don't even think about being like these guys. Nothing wrong with bald heads, guys, but don't <laughs> do it on purpose. <laughs> And we need to make sure that we, we learn, you know, we learn from the lessons of um, Leviticus and the children of Israel. And the thing is, like, God doesn't want his people. He didn't want the Israelites emulating reprobates, emulating sodomites, because these people, like, God knew what they were like. Like, the Israelites might look at them and think, well, they're okay, they're just a bit different to us, and they kind of look a bit cool and look a bit interesting, but... God knows their reprobates at heart. That's why the nations were to be destroyed, because they're wicked people, and God knows what's in their heart. And he doesn't want us emulating or enjoying being entertained by reprobates. And make no mistake, Leviticus 18, verse 21, have a look there. Leviticus 18, verse 21, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, Neither shall they profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. And thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So that's just a sample of the wicked abominations that you can read about in Leviticus chapter 18. If you want to know how wicked people can be, read that chapter in your own time. So these people were homosexuals. They were reprobates. They were sodomites. And God was saying, look, I know what they're like. You guys don't. Just trust me. Don't, you don't even want to look, look like these people. And in the world today, the people that are popular, who are setting fashion trends and things like that, most of them, or a good portion of them, are reprobate, homosexual type people. We don't want to be looking at the world, getting man buns, skinny jeans, things like that, because these people, they're wicked people, and God knows it. And we ought to learn from Leviticus and not mar our corners, corners of our beards and be like these wicked people. Uh, just jump down now to verse 24, Leviticus 18, 24. Defile not ye yourself in any of these things, for in all these, th- all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. So these are wicked people. I'm sure when Moses is preaching this sermon to Israel, and he's preaching about don't, Part, don't put your seed through the fire. Don't have relations with all these sorts of strange flesh and don't be a sodomite and all these things. I'm, I'm sure they're looking at each other and thinking, what in the world? Like, who's going to be doing that? Like, who's, who's doing that? But God knows where it can lead to. And he also says, don't round the corners of your beard. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. So we might hear preaching in this church against fornication, adultery, lying, all manner of wicked sins, and you might be thinking, no one's going to be committing adultery. No one's committing, no one's committing fornication or would, but it can happen. That's why we need to preach hard against sin. And, and I bet you those guys there in Moses' church in the wilderness were thinking, steady on Moses. You know, there you go. Like, who's, that, there's some wicked sins you're preaching against there. And if you read Leviticus 18, you can see for yourself. But a little leaven leaven left the whole lump. A little bit of compromise is where it starts. If you can turn to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 22. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, therefore I abhor them. But I said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, to possess it a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. Again, God is in the separation business. He wants us to be separated from the world. Separated in appearance, separated in lifestyle, separated in what we believe. Like God is into separation. So we want to be separate 
from the world. I see a lot of um, so-called churches which actually go out into the world, ask the world what they like, and then make their churches, model their churches after what worldly people say, what they, what they want from a church. That's just wicked. And these are the pastors that look like the world. Like I, I meet people and see people out and about, and I, I see this some um, metro-looking guy, and I'm thinking, well, that guy's probably a youth pastor because he's just got the skinny jeans on and all the, you know, the, 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 his mar the corners of his beard and all that sort of stuff. And I think, well, this guy's probably a youth leader, but he's probably not. But youth leaders just look like what's ever trendy in the world to try and relate to kids. And we don't want to be like the world, even in appearance. We want to be separate from the world in appearance. Just dress normal. Dress like a man. If you're a woman, dress like a woman. And what I mean being separate in appearance is we don't go after the trends of the world. We don't follow celebrities on Instagram, Facebook, and we see that, like the, the man bun thing, doesn't that make you feel sick? When you see a man with a man bun, we be separate from the world. Kids don't get man buns. And like, like what in the world? Like seriously? Because I think the first person I saw with a, a man bun was Leonardo DiCaprio. I think he was the first person that I was aware of to, to rock a man bun. And people saw that emulate a wicked person. And well, we want to be separate in appearance from the world. I remember one time I was shopping for jeans. I like the good pair of manly jeans. And I'm trying on some jeans on. And I put this pair on. And they're a bit tight around here. And I thought, Aaron, they're skinny jeans. They're skinny jeans. Get them, get them away. We don't, want to, we don't want to look like the world. Okay, we want to be separate from the world. Even in appearance, in lifestyle, in philosophy, in what we believe, separate from the world. Have a look at verse 25, Leviticus 20, verse 25. Even in the ordinances that God gave them in their rituals and the things they had to do, he was teaching them separation. Verse 25. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable, abominable by beast or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, for I have separated you from separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I am the Lord, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. So even in the ordinances that God was teaching them separation. Like this animal you can't eat, this animal you can separation. Even the clothing, you can't put certain clothing together. God's in, to, God's in to teach them separation. That's how big a deal separation is. Please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Verse 1. It says there, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and have cast out many nations before thee, the, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jezebites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, and thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter shall... Thou shalt not give unto his son, thou shalt not give unto his son, and his daughter thou shalt take unto thy son. Thou shalt thou take unto thy son. Sorry, I messed that up a little bit. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So God teaches, teaches the children of Israel here and us the attitude we need to have towards worldliness towards the way of the world and the, the, the world systems because the whole world is under the sway of the of the wicked one not under god's power under god's control or influence it's, it's of the of the wicked one I have a look there in verse 2 and god's saying to them don't be soft don't be half-hearted it says there thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them and thou shalt make no covenant with them and that's the attitude we need to have to worldliness, to the things of this world. We need to utterly destroy them. Don't make covenants with them. Don't entertain the world, the world's thinking, the world's music, the world's uh, music and 
movies and all sorts of things. We need to actually destroy those things. They're going to cause us to be compromised as a believer. And verse 5, But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So we don't need to make sure that we destroy all influence of the world system. I guess that's a big deal. That's not an easy thing to do because when you're saved, you're just worldly. That's all you are. You're just a worldly person and you get saved and then you need to learn to live according to God's word. So that's a process. That takes um, many, many years, okay? And we need to make sure we start to learn what God hates, what God loves, and live accordingly. And we're going to be pleasing to God if we can do that. But unfortunately, with the children of Israel, even though they had these strong commandments, these strong warnings from God, these strong teachings, even their ordinances taught them to be, to be separate from the world, unfortunately, we all know that they failed. They still messed up, like... Despite all that, they still failed. Like they started to wear the skinny jeans, the man buns, all those sort of things. They started to follow the Canaanite celebrities on Instagram, Facebook, all these sort of things. And they started to mingle with the people. All they started, all, all they started doing was mingling, not going to their wild parties and orgies and doing wicked, abominable things. They just started just mingling with the world, just being comfortable with the Canaanites and those of the land. Just turn to Psalm 106, if you can, verse 34. Psalm 106, verse 34. And it says there, They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. So it says there that they, they mingled with the people of the land and they learned their ways. Where God said, you shall not learn their ways. You see here they did. They did learn their ways and started by mingling, by being comfortable with the Canaanites, the people of the land. And where, where did it end up? It ended up in verse 37 that they were sacrificing their sons and their daughters unto devils. Started with a bit of mingling and then ended sacrificing their sons and daughters to Moloch and to devils. Like, that's, that's, that's pretty horrible, horrific to, to imagine that. So we need to make sure we don't mingle with the, the way of the world. So I'm not talking about don't be with people, don't be with people of the world, but we don't want to learn their ways. We don't want to become, become comfortable with the world's philosophy and, and the world's ways of, of, of doing life. So if you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. And let's have a look at what happened with the children of Israel. And while you're turning there, I'll read to you from Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. It says there, Now when these things were done, the princesses came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the, Jeb the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. So they did not separate themselves from the land. So 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7 says, Therefore so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. So it all started with them doing things in secret. They knew they were wicked, they knew they were wrong, therefore they were doing these things in secret. So I guess we need to make sure what we do in secret before God, God sees, God knows that it's not wicked. We don't want to just be... One thing before people and secretly 
We're doing abominable things. We're doing wicked things, okay? That's where it starts. So doing things in secret. Verse 15. Just jump down to verse 15, if you can, of chapter 17 in 2 Kings. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And have a look at verse 16. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God. They left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made the molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. It says there, verse 16, they left all the commandments of the Lord. So there was a commandment, don't mar the corners of your beard. They left that. That means they did it. They did that. So they started to mingle, they started to leave God's commandments, which were to protect them from doing the abominations of the Canaanites. And they left those commandments, they didn't obey them, and like, as we said before, ended up with their passing their children through the fire, sacrificing their sons and daughters to devils, using divination and enchantments. So this is where it ended up with the Israelites, and they failed to, to obey God's commandments, and they became just like the, the people of the land and did all their abominations. So what's the application for us today? Well, I've already mentioned it in passing, but the lesson is that we need to be separate from the world. That's the lesson that we can take. Because we can see here how zealous God was that his children, children of Israel, were separate from the world and to be holy. He's just as zealous today for us, for the church, for God's people, to be separate from the world, just as zealous. Okay, and um, turn to Romans chapter 12. Verse 1, so we need to overcome the influence of the world in our lives. And like Israel, if we compromise with the world round about us, we're going to go further than we thought we would go. Romans 12 verse 1 says there, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we need to renew our minds. Like I said before, we're, we've been living in the world until you got saved, and then you need to renew your mind and know what's pleasing to God. And that's why we come to church, that's why we read the Word of God, and we start to understand what's pleasing to God. Okay? And have a look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. And uh, this uh, leads on from having to renew our minds. It says there in Colossians 2 verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So if we want to be separate from the world, we need to understand how we ought to live, how we ought to think according to the word of God. Because the world, they've got their, their rudiments, their, their principles, their philosophies, and we don't want to be deceived into living according to the world. And just some of these philosophies uh, which come to mind will be, for example, feminism. So many so-called Christians are deceived by feminism. Yeah. It's, a, it's a wicked philosophy of the world. Yeah. If we want to be pleasing to God, we need to be separate from these philosophies. We need to understand what the Bible says, about the roles of the husband, the wife, and the children, and live according according to the to the, um, the word of God. Feminism is wicked. Like it teaches that it, it, it shames a man to be a strong, powerful leader. It's, it's, it shames that. It makes oh, yeah, I feel so intimidated by that person. He's been so so manly and so masculine and so strong. His his muscles are so big, and I just feel so intimidated by that that by that man. And that's what. It's almost a shame to be like a strong, manly man. That's what feminism is teaching. And men, look at men today, like more so than, than when I was back in the 80s and the 90s. Like men these days are so effeminate and getting back to the man buns, skinny jeans. Like back in the 80s, you would not wear a man bun in a small country town where I'm from. 
like it's, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? Like, these are the philosophies we need to be separated from and then we need to preach against these things. Environmentalism, that's another wicked philosophy of the world. Like, teaching humans are evil, environment, animals, good. Climate change, all these wicked philosophies of the world, we need to be separate from those, separate from those things and the Sodomite agenda, all these wicked things that the devil is trying to infiltrate into the, into the world through his wicked philosophies and, and rudiments, his first principles, things like that. But we need to renew our minds and just be against those things. And that's why if you don't go to church, you don't read your Bible, you're going to be deceived by these things. You're going to be panicking, thinking the world's going to end. You'll be panicking, thinking... <coughs> That, you know, what's it mean to be a man? Is it okay to, to be manly? <laughs> All these wicked things. Yeah. You know, we need to understand, we don't want to, also, you want to understand that it's up to the, the mum and dad to raise their kids. Right. And you don't want to, while well, we we're reading about how wicked the world is and how we need to be separate, then do we take our children and give our children to the world and say, look, raise our kids for us or we go and make money? After the, um, the teachings of the world, we want to be rich and happy and have all this stuff, but you raise our kids for us? Just foolishness, not pleasing to God at all. Not, not pleasing to God at all. So what would be the New Testament equivalent of ma not the corners of your beard? What verse would be the, uh, the New Testament equivalent? I would say 1 Philosians, Philosians, Thessalonians, Thessalonians, got it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So anything that's evil, don't even appear to be like it. Like the Canaanites were wicked, evil people, and God didn't want them to eat, his people to even appear to be like the Canaanites. Well, we want to make sure we're separate from the world. Like we don't want to be wearing T-shirts advertising wicked, worldly people, for example. Like, you know, I shouldn't be wearing heavy metal T-shirts, or you shouldn't be wearing pop star t-shirts and, and just following the fashions of the world, that's, you need to abstain from every appearance of evil. You might say, look, I can listen to this type of music, it's okay, but you listen to it, it sounds wicked. Oh, no, it's, it's a Christian heavy metal band. It's all good. But no, it, it appears to be evil. It sounds like evil worldly music. Abstain from every appearance of evil. We need to not listen to... You listen to Hillsong music, it just sounds like the world, doesn't it? That's why the world loves it. That's why it gets in the charts, in the, world, in the world's charts. That's why it's popular than worldly people, with worldly people. But then what happens is they listen to it and they go, this really is crap, this really is trash. And then when you go to um, second-hand bookshops, things like that, it's full of Hillsong music because even the world doesn't like Hillsong. But they try and sound like the world but fail. <coughs> so we want to just make sure we're separate in philosophy, separate in appearance, separate in entertainment, separate in music, separate in movies. There's pretty good documentaries you can watch these days coming out of like-minded churches. But just want to be separate. from You can never be too separate from the world and holy. Like God wants you to be holy unto himself. You need to have a clear conscience before God. You, you'll know. Like I know where I compromise with the world because of my conscience. And same with you. And we need to seek to be more Godly and less worldly. Uh, James 4, if you can turn to James chapter 4, verse 4. James 4, verse 4 says there, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Wow. Wow. That's pretty confronting stuff there. Like the Apostle James, he's preaching pretty hard. If you, if, you, if you like the world, if you're friendly towards the world, look, God looks at you as his enemy. That's pretty strong stuff. Like, well, that's pretty hard to take. Like I think about certain things I'm kind of friendly towards in the world. Like I, I don't hate and despise. Like certain, I'll be honest, certain types of music I kind of like. I don't like hate it. I'm kind of like want to be friendly with certain certain things, but then I don't want to be God's enemy, so I've got, to make, I've got to make a choice. You have to make a choice. We want to be God's friend, not God's enemy. And 1 John verse 2, if you can turn there, 1 John chapter 2. 
verse 15, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. While you're turning there, let me read to you Ephesians 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. You want to be following God, not the world or the world's ways. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That's a lot of things, guys. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is a pretty confronting scripture. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Let's make sure we don't love the world. Learn to love God, not the world. The thing is, whatever you forsake of this world, it might be hard to do it, but once you do it, you'll, you'll find you've got a greater love for God. Like You've got to step out in faith. and go, Look, I'm going to burn these CDs, burn all these books, and then you might think, well, it's going to hurt. It, it might for a moment, but once you do that and God sees your obedience, you're going to be blessed. You're going to start to be blessed by God's presence, God's power in your life. I know when I got saved, um, I didn't have anyone discipling me and helping me, but I knew my heavy metal music was, was wicked, it was, it, was, it was wrong. And it was a bit of a process for me to separate myself from that. I got the music I, I knew was really wicked and evil, and I got that, I put that aside, and I went out the, out the front and I put it in the bin, and then as soon as I put it in the bin and started walking back up to the house, the garbage truck came around the corner and took it. So that was just like God sort of encouraged me, you're doing the right thing here, getting rid of this stuff. And then... And then after that, I got some music which I liked a bit more, which is a little bit harder to let go of. And I w- again, I went out and I threw it in the bin. I still had some other stuff in, in the house, which I was more not ready to get rid of, which is my favourite band, which invested lots of time and money into, which I wasn't ready to get, get rid of. But I knew I was going to have to, but this wasn't there yet. So, anyway, so I get this my second tier bands and I put them in the bin and I walk back inside and I think... No, that's a bad decision. I'm going to go get that stuff back out. Ain't no word of a lie. Before I could, the garbage truck came and took it. <laughs> but then, look, then I did, I burnt all the other stuff. And, but over the years, it, it's, it's crept back in, how to get rid of it again. So it is, it is a journey. And um, look, and I guess you've got your things that you need to get victory over. They may creep back in, which you need to chuck back out again. But it's worth it. Like when I got rid of that stuff, look, my spiritual life was much better than compromising with the world, which it's not pleasing to God. We know where that ends. It always takes you further. Like if I get listen to one CD, pretty soon it's going to be two CDs, three CDs. For me, I can't just... I've got to be separate from the world and not compromise at all, not even mar my corners of my beard to be like the world, so to speak. Okay? And have a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Nearly there now. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, just like the children of Israel were a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvellous light which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation." We're a peculiar people. We're a people that's separated from God, a, to God, a holy nation. We need to be separate from the world. Our workmates should look at us and go, you're different. What's wrong with you? You're peculiar. That's how it should be. I know at work, um, when they're talking about all the shows they're watching on Netflix and things like that, and after work I do this, I do that. What do you do, Jason? What Don't do any of that. Well, what's wrong with you? That's good. That's what I want people to say. I want people to look at me and think, well, what's wrong with you? How can you don't do these things? And, and um, here's an example. Let's read to you. Don't turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Here's an example of a believer that went after the world, that, that failed to separate himself from the world. For, let me read to you. 2 Timothy 4, 10. 
For Demas hath forsaken me, this is the Apostle Paul speaking here, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. So even Demas, which was one of Paul's fellow soul winners, companions, he left Paul because he loved the world. So somewhere along the line, he failed to separate himself from the world. He looked at the world and, I don't know, maybe instead of going to church, he went to like a, a making money seminar or something, but he started to move away from going to church, going on mission trips to seeking after the world. And pretty soon, I'm, he, he ended up being in the world, following after the world and giving himself to this present world. So it can happen. Like Good people can, with a little bit of compromise, end up loving this present world and be out of church. And I bet if you could talk to Demas in heaven now, I'm sure he was saved, spending time with Paul. If you could talk to him now, he'd be pretty hard on himself for loving this present world and leaving Paul. And we don't want to be like Demas and backslide and go after this world. And it all starts with making sure we don't look like the world. We don't start to take any steps towards the world's ways of doing things. And um, as, as men, and especially fathers, now, we didn't need to make sure that our, our families are raised, our children are raised to be separate from the world because our children can come under, under attack. We don't want to pass our children through the fire, so to speak. And you, you're doing that if you're putting your kids into school system, daycare. You might not, you would probably, you would never put your, a sacrifice your, your children to Moloch. Yeah. But in a kind of a, in a kind of a sense, you are if you're giving your children to the world and say, look, raise my children. They're like, yes. The devil's like, we've got this one. We can't get mum and dad, but we've got the children. And that's what happens. so sad to see pastors' kids, um, the leaders' kids of, of good Christian families, you know, go down that, that path. I know as, as a family, um, as we've grown as Christians, me and Erin and with the children, we've realised, hey, we're doing things wrong. Like our, our kids have been going to the school system and we've had kids in, in daycare when they're really little and we're vaccinated and all sorts of things. But then we're, we're learning God's ways. We're re- renewing our minds and we realise, well, we need to start to change some of these things. And, but the thing is, I, I liken it to like a big cargo ship going that direction. And then you realise, well, we're supposed to be going that way. And you can't just turn it around in a second. So we had over months and, and years, and we're probably still are turning the ship a little bit, it, it takes a lot of time, but the thing is, as long as you're turning that ship towards God's direction, that's the main thing. So I guess the, the lesson here is that you might have your ship go in the right direction and you might look at someone else who's got their ship turned this far. And you don't want to judge that person and say, oh, look at that person, their kids are in school and they're doing this and they're getting vaccinations, but really they realise that they're wrong and they've started to turn their ship. And you want to encourage them not to sink their ship so to speak. Okay, so it's, it is a big deal to renew your mind as, as a father, to get your family back on track and get them living for God. And we need to support one another, encourage one another, not kick each other, not shoot the wounded. And we want to be encouraging the brethren, encouraging the, the fathers and the families that we can help them to get their ship going in the right direction so their next generation can exceed us and do better works than us. So I want to end with the question. So is it wrong to round the corners of your beard today? Is it wrong to, to have, have a goatee or shave the top of your head? <clears throat> well, Galatians 5.18 says, but if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. So it's not really a, a question you need to answer. Like if you're walking in the Spirit, you don't need to, to worry about what the laws are. For example, if you're being led by the Spirit, are you going to go and then break the commandments? No, you're not. Like, if you've been led by the Spirit, are you, are you then going to put marks upon your flesh? Are you then going to go and get tattoos? Like, the Holy Spirit is never going to lead you to break his commandments. So he's not going to lead you to look like the world, is he? So if you're walking in the Spirit, well, you're not going to break any commandments. You're not going to mar the corners of your beard. So whether or not it's, it's wrong to shave the, corner, the edges of your beard, well, walk in the Spirit and you, you'll do what's right. And you'll do what's right. Let's just end with um, one verse that uh, is from John 14, verse 30. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. And this is, he's such a great example, isn't he? I just love this about Jesus when he says this. And we should try and be like Jesus as much as we can. It says there, Hereafter I would not talk much with you, 
for the prince of this world cometh and have nothing in me. That was Jesus' testimony. Yet the prince of this world had nothing in Jesus. And look, that's, that should be our goal. We should be able to say the prince of this world has nothing in me. There's nothing of the world in me. That should be our goal. As we walk in the spirit day by day, we should be looking to be more like Christ, less like the world every day. Let's leave it there.